History, Kelloland salute to Hispanic heritage. Thank you for joining us for our special Hidden History Show as we look at Hispanic heritage here in Kelloland and across the country. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, nearly 4% of South Dakota's population is Hispanic. Beetle County has the largest percentage of Hispanic people at nearly 9%. From 1990 to 2000, South Dakota saw a drastic increase in the Hispanic population from just 5,600 in 1990 to nearly 11,000 by 2000. We're here at the Multicultural Center in Sioux Falls. Here, families can get help applying for jobs, finding a home, and learning how to speak English. Staff also help people with the immigration process. That has become a hot topic of discussion, including the Trump administration proposed wall and the outrage after thousands of children were separated from their parents at the border. There are news stories the people sitting around this table are following closely. They have a variety of jobs. Many come from different Kelloland communities, but everyone at this table has a Hispanic background. The rhetoric that's currently taking place in the United States is very hateful. It's very demeaning. Um, it, it, it hits home and it, and it, and it impacts students. And um, they, they may be simple statements that people don't realize are, are actually, um, you know, influencing and impacting others, but they really are. I think it's been really hard right now, like in 2018 for a lot of us. I mean, even though South Dakota has been uh, awesome for us living here, um, one of the biggest things for us is just seeing everything unfolding in the news in other states. Sioux Falls sales analyst Francisco Alvarez Evangelista points out the power of the ballot box. In this political environment, it's important to, you know, everyone's going to have their opinions at the end of the day. A lot of people are going to keep their opinions however they may be. But if you want to make things better and if you, you think you, your vote is uh, going to make a difference, then I think you should go vote. And, you know, and, and make that vo make your voice heard through that venue. Voting being an active part of a community, also building relationships with people that don't know any better. So I love sharing things about me, and I love learning a lot from people. You vote for a candidate that you think is tackling racism. That's also a way to t yourself tackle racism by using your power as a voter to influence that. There is also the option of being on the ballot yourself. If you don't like what's currently taking place in politics, then I suggest you run for office or support that one candidate that you know has that view that, that's going to help shift that, that mentality, change those people, change that community. I use being Hispanic as a privilege to educate other people about how it is to be Hispanic in a prominently white state. I ask group members how they respond when someone says they don't see color, that they are colorblind. Revelorio doesn't mince words here. I think that statement is absurd. I think it's important to see color. It's important to see it because that way we recognize that we're all different and there's beauty in difference. So. And in recognizing that we're different, you start to accept Mm -hmm. and learn and grow from each individual and realize that each person has something beautiful that they can provide. Each person is an asset. We all are diverse whether we like it or not. Some people just don't understand that concept and we can only do so much before it's a dead end. Alvarez Evangelista brings up a way to continue and redirect conversations when someone says they don't see color. I think oftentimes we, we should shift that conversation to how do we make things better and understand and tackle tackle the situations of I don't see color as okay, well let me tell you why you should. So I always tell my students, I say, get out there. Don't don't be in the shadows. Who's gonna defend and who's gonna fight for you, who's gonna speak up for you if you're not doing it yourselves? And so the Latin American Student Association at SDSU has been extremely vocal. Around this table, we didn't just talk about the present. We also discussed the future and how they're feeling about it. I asked 19-year-old USD student Isabella Gasca if she's optimistic. I like to think I am. Like, I think like our generation is willing to fight 
for like equal rights and like what's right and what's wrong like we want to like improve the world for for our future and like for our kids and we're like we're just not willing to accept like things that happen to us the other college student at the table has a similar take i think i'm pretty optimistic i'd like to see more growth um in the years to come hopefully with what experience I've been through and what other individuals have told me, I hope to use that knowledge and step up and say, hey, this is what I believe in. And there is, no matter what obstacle I have to go through, I will be bigger than that. We're laying the groundwork. Sure. And we're paving the way. And we, I think we're at a great time to create opportunities for our children. So I am very optimistic. Across the table, Reynosa echoes this. I'm very optimistic, yes. Um, I have some, some of my kids already, one of them is out of college, um, some of them are in high school. And just to see that they themselves are already in that mindset of standing up for their beliefs, standing up for um, for the race and, and saying, hey, you know, yeah, I am Hispanic, but this, this, is, this is me, this is, this is how we are. We are just getting started with our Hispanic Heritage Hidden History Special. Coming up after the break. There was a lot of illiterate farmers and the artist took the lead in educating people who couldn't read by using art to inspire people to revolution. How art continues to speak to a Hispanic community in California to keep their history and culture alive. We're back right after this. Welcome back to our Hidden History Special on Hispanic Heritage. Sioux Falls is becoming more diverse by the day. One of the neighborhoods seeing the most diversity is Whittier. The park inside the neighborhood consists of open space, picnic areas, and a basketball court. But a blank wall on one of the park's edges has become a target for graffiti. So one of the teachers at Whittier Middle School challenged her eighth graders to find ways to improve the area. They came up with this mural to honor the diversity of the neighborhood. Another mural in San Francisco is also honoring the city's Hispanic community. Maureen Kelly introduces us to some of the artists who design, paint, and preserve the artwork. What we have here is uh, cultural heroes and icons combined with people in the neighborhood. Muralist Carlos Kuki Gonzalez is talking about his recently restored and revamped artwork. He's been working on murals in the Mission District since the 1970s and says the art form has long roots in the Latino community, going back to the Mexican Revolution. There was a lot of illiterate farmers, and the artist took the lead in educating people who couldn't read by using art to inspire people to revolution. By the time he was working on his mural where civil rights activists Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta are the centerpieces, the mural movement became closely tied to social struggle. That tradition is being kept alive by artists behind this mural, entitled Women of the Resistance, who say their goal is to inspire others. We hope that women or anybody walking by would say, that's like my mother, that's like my sister. They're strong. I see that they're empowered. A walk down the same alley shows murals many with political messages from the past and the present, including this one showing the struggle of longtime Mission District residents against gentrification and displacement as the tech boom is bringing in new residents and forcing others to move away. Murals reflect the neighborhoods that they're in. They're like a library on the wall. So it gives us a lot of knowledge about stuff that isn't necessarily written into the history books. It's counter histories, it's histories of the neighborhood. The now trendy neighborhood is drawing tourists who come and snap pictures of the wide variety of vibrant art on the walls, many paintings reflecting the Latino American culture. The face of rock legend Carlos Santana is featured prominently on a wall off Mission Street. Not far away, a homeowner has dedicated the entire exterior of his home to the celebration of Latin rock. I wanted to preserve a big piece of the Mission District history, and I wanted to make sure that it stuck around forever. 
you know, because of all the, you know, the different corporations moving in and buying up all the properties. See, they can't, they can't buy my house. It's not for sale. It's a public art gallery, a museum of the streets, reflecting both the beauty and the struggle of the neighborhood. Another area of Sioux Falls that celebrates diversity is right here at Falls Park. The park hosts the annual Cinco de Mayo Festival, which celebrates the cultural gifts and heritage of the Latino community. It features food, dance, art, music, and more. This is also the site of the weekly Falls Park Farmer's Market, which is still running through the month of October. In Peoria, Illinois, the community celebrates its Hispanic heritage each week at the Mexican Farmer's Market. Rosario Dominguez explains why this market is more than just a place to shop. The Vargas family has lived in Peoria for decades. And in that time, they realized something was missing from their community. There's really not a big re representation of the uh, Latin community, and we wanted to bring that out uh, with the, you know, to represent our culture. So last year, the family members decided to open Tianguis, a Mexican outdoor market open during the summer. What happens at, a, at the Tianguis is um, everybody that sells like produce or make items at home, they take it weekly to a spot that they designate and they sell it there. Maria says the purpose of this event is to create a sense of community. And we're seeing that Hispanics or Latin people are, are starting to come to uh, Peoria and we want them to feel a home. And we are getting a lot of that. People are saying that, oh, we're you know, so happy that you're here. This open market gives an opportunity for those who participate to make extra money and share their unique products to a diverse crowd. Estoy vendiendo blusas de México, todo esto es de México, blusas, collares, pulseras, cintos. Y trajes de bailables de Veracruz me motivó eh, que conozcan algo de mi, eh, cosas de mi país, eh, la tradición de mi país, eh, lo, las cosas hechas a mano. Not only has Tianguis given Hispanics a space to relive moments from their native country. It's also brought back familiar settings for others. Nina Clark says this place reminds her of the time she lived in Chicago near a Hispanic neighborhood. Came over here to check out the food. Good to see if they have food. Like the tacos, I love the taco with the sauce or everything. And that and the find out what you know what it's all about. The open market offers family friendly fun, dancing, authentic food, and according to some who attend, the best tacos in town. And we want to show the, the artists and the crafters and everyone that this is a place that you want to come and shop. There's still more to come for our Hispanic heritage hidden history. Coming up after the break. Now it's, uh, it's like a whole, a whole one family now. How one community in Illinois is showing that there is more that unites us than divides us next. Welcome back to our Hispanic Heritage Hidden History Special. We're here at Our Lady of Guadalupe along East 8th Street in Sioux Falls. The church offers mass in Spanish and English. It also hosts all kinds of events to celebrate the local Hispanic culture. In Arcola, Illinois, a Hispanic community there is also sharing its roots with anyone who visits. Aaron Edies with our sister station in Champaign visits the town. In America's broom town, it's not hard to get swept into stories about a unique history, if you know where to look. We're just part of this town now. We feel part of this town. Herlinda Garza Kaufman is a volunteer at the town's Walk Through Time Museum. She's working on an exhibit to share her family's heritage. My father came to Arcola in 1967. His friend Fidel Silva was already here, working in the broom factory making handmade brooms. The broom corn was being imported from our hometown. My father was a broom maker by trade in Mexico, made hand, handmade brooms, and they were needed here because that art had been lost. 
Back then, only a handful of people worked at the Libman factory, making brooms. Now the company employs hundreds, but as more and more workers brought their skills from Mexico, getting settled in central Illinois was an uphill battle at first. I came here without speaking a word of English. Rolando Ambris moved here in 1976 when he says things were very different. We weren't quite welcome. I remember walking down the street and people call us names and stuff like that. Manuel Berrientos came five years later. There used to be fights every day after school. <laughs> They come from school and, and there were fights about only because they look different. Going to school was difficult. You know, you have children that maybe they've never even seen a person from Mexico. It took time, but slowly they changed hearts and minds. People uh, start treating us different after they got to know us. And I think I can say now that we're all one big family. We're so integrated into our schools, our town. Now it's, a, it's like a whole, a whole one family now. We got a lot of friends, they're, they're Hispanic, a lot of friends, they're, they're white. Today, leaders estimate close to half of the community identifies as Hispanic. Many members of the next generation have left town and returned. But no matter who comes or goes, Arcola will always be home to a unique culture, bound in brooms and forged in America's melting pot. Most of the people there are afraid for what they don't know. If they don't they know that our community, they, if they know our community better, they are uh, they understand where, the, where we come from and uh, how we've been success here in this area. It's possible to, to have two cultures live in the same town, work together and be friends. Another mission of the church is to help their members feel safe in their community. That's what one Florida officer is doing for the kids in his neighborhood. Marco Villarreal from our sister station in Tampa shows us how he's using boxing lessons to give the children a fighting chance. What does it take to make a champion? For these kids, it starts with the right training. Who here remembers how far apart your feet should be when you're in your boxing stance? Leading the training at Powerhouse Gym, Officer Dennis Small. That's right, officer and coach. Never in a million years did I assume that I was A, going to be a Hispanic liaison officer or B, a boxing coach for this program. I want that right hand still back here. On the city of Tampa Police Force, Small volunteers his extra time to the boxing program, now part of the Police Athletic League. Known as PAL, it's a nonprofit giving kids a chance at after school and summer sports programs. In many instances, they're broken homes. Many instances, it's uh, you know single parents that are doing their best, working multiple jobs, trying to raise their kids the best way they can. Inspired by a former fraternity brother and three-time boxing world champion, Officer Small pitched the idea to his superiors, and they loved it. Pal partnered with Tampa Housing Authority, and they brought in the kids needing this type of support. First, at a smaller training facility called Legends Gym. Then, Powerhouse opened up their state-of-the-art space for free. Other community partnerships soon followed. These kids and their families don't pay a dime. The way he explained it is exactly correct. If I'm right-handed, my right foot is going to be back. This goes beyond proper fighting techniques. Knowing right and wrong, understanding that gut feeling that you have, this is probably going to put me in a bad situation. What would my coach say? And the word is spreading about the success of this program that teaches discipline, obedience, and stamina. Since we are in a predominantly Latino neighborhood, we're starting to attract more and more Hispano parlantes. Step jab, step jab. This is so much more than just gloves and rings and bells. The bonds between these cops coaching kids is spreading into the community. Not only have you established that relationship with that young kid, but now mom and dad or their grandmother, their abuelas, they have a resource in you, you know, and they now feel like they can entrust the safety and security of their children with us, and that means the world to us as coaches and police officers. So what makes a champion? Officer Small seems to have a good idea. That I send you home and you're safe, you're alive, you learn something, and you pay it forward, to me that is a champion. Coming up in our final segment of Hispanic Heritage Hidden History. Harvard has been my dream since I was 12 years old, back in Cuba. We're looking to the future as kids from all different backgrounds and cultures shape the fate of our country. Next. Outside of the Sonia Sotomayor Spanish Immersion School in Sioux Falls. 
Inside this school, kids are taught a second language by immersing them in a classroom with Spanish-speaking teachers. Students read, write, and speak Spanish as they go through their daily lessons. For families coming from Latin America, it's the opposite. They have to learn how to speak English in order to succeed. And that's what one exceptional young man from Cuba is doing. Marco Villarreal with our sister station in Tampa, Florida, shows us how he blazed a trail to Harvard. If you see Carlos Garcia Perez in the hallway, it's easy to see he's a superstar around here. Yeah, bro, come over here. Freshly graduated, he won't soon be forgotten. His picture is displayed in a glass case for all to know. Carlos is Gaither High's newest valedictorian. I mean, it was a big goal, but it was, it was a goal that when I was up at 1, 2, even 3 a.m., and I was doing my work, I, I, I knew, you know, that's what I was doing it for. Carlos's drive to succeed began freshman year when he saw a banner with the names of the graduates with highest marks hanging high in the center of the school. When you were a freshman, did you really think you were going to be able to accomplish that goal? Yes. It wasn't easy. His story started in a neighborhood outside Havana, Cuba. Hey, my family actually came over here as political refugees. His parents wanted Carlitos to do more than just work hard in life. They wanted him to succeed. That's something that, that was not available in Cuba where there is corruption and all kinds of things. You can work as hard as you as you can, and then at the end, it's not within your power. Five years ago, his family made it to the U.S. Now, Carlos needed to learn English. I read uh, children's books. I listened to uh, kids' music. You know, watch little cartoons with the uh, closed captioning. Carlos quickly excelled. By the time he made it to high school, his English was down, and he was making loftier goals. Harvard had been my dream since I was 12 years old back in Cuba. The kid who just learned English wanted to attend the most prestigious university in the country. Carlos joined clubs. He signed up for the hardest classes. All that hard work got him acceptance letters from the top schools in the U.S. Princeton University very early, um, also Yale University, Stanford, uh, Dartmouth, and Harvard. Carlos will never forget sitting bumper to bumper in the car with his dad when he got the call he'd been waiting for since he was 12. You're not very excited about traffic. I think we're <laughs> the most excited people in, uh, in the two miles of stock traffic. Are you nervous about leaving your family? <sighs> I think they're more nervous than me. Are they? But yeah, I think we both are. That quickly turns to excitement as he starts his new semester just outside of Boston. Pretty sure I want to go into law school. Mi güey es en el mundo. In his winning essay awarded by Tampa Hispanic Heritage, Inc., Carlos talks about the footprint he wants to leave behind. Los hispanos tenemos una gran responsabilidad de asegurarnos de que nuestro legado sea uno que sirva de ejemplo digno a seguir por futuras generaciones. Just by giving them stories of our success and showing that the American dream is very much alive and that anything is possible, we give all the people, you know, hope, and we show them that it can be done. Getting into Harvard is just the beginning. Sat down, I wrote some more goals, and then now those seem far away and crazy again, but hopefully I can get to those two. That's all the time we have. Thank you for joining us for this special look at the hidden history of our Hispanic heritage. For more information about these stories, head to Kelloland.com.